Good evening. Uh, it's nice to have you here. I'm Marilyn Taylor. I have the honor and pleasure of being the dean of this great school of design at the University of Pennsylvania here in the wonderful, thriving, growing, and extraordinary city of Philadelphia. And so it is my pleasure to say welcome to our house. Thank you all for being here. Uh, I think you've, you're probably in the correct place. We're assembling here for City Futures, a conversation about cities and urbanism seen through architects' eyes. The focus on architects is intentional as this is the lead off event in our celebration of 125 years of architectural education at the University of Pennsylvania. Instruction in architecture actually began three decades earlier, but the curriculum and degree in architecture was initiated in 1890 on the premise, and this is a quote from historians Anne Strong and George Thomas, that the new role of the architect, by which they meant both as professional and artist, required a broader education, making the architect a man of culture. We can choose to comment on whether we've succeeded in that perhaps, but that was their view. So when the initial professor, Warren Laird, was joined by Paul Cray, the American Beaux-Arts truly arrived at Penn. Penn became the only American school, Strong and Thomas say, with an, interna with an international reputation in the early 20th century. Laird handled the professional, Cray, a rather mercurial figure, the artistic. The school centered around the atelier. The students were young men, 17 to 18 years old, who studied for three to five years, depending on their career expectations and trajectory. Skipping forward a mere century, it's a pleasure to have a great architecture faculty in place and a chairman of our department who truly knows her stuff, stands her ground, and sets very high expectations for architectural education here now at Penn Design. Winka Doubledom. Where did you disappear to, Winka? Yay, there she is. It's also Winka to whom I extend my thanks for conceiving and convening this symposium together with faculty member Daniela Fabricius uh, and uh, PhD student Joe Watson and our staff members Maria Teicher and Arlene Adair. Thank you all for the work it took to get everyone here in this room tonight. It's my expectation that the remarks and the discussion will run the gamut from speculation to vision and on to social impact and action. The discussion begins with the three questions posed in your invitation. What form will the city take of the future take? What new models have been produced by today's urban realities? What roles will architects play in shaping the city of tomorrow? I'd like to add a little bit more of my own perspective to that as a start to thinking about tonight's lecture and tomorrow's program. And in a sense, I want to address three things which I believe could be characterized as terms of engagement. Cities are extraordinary and complex. They grow, succeed, fail, thrive, and die in ways that are perhaps predictable, but they, also, they are also indeterminate. So the first term is indeterminate. Indeterminacy begets risks, the second term, both internal and external. Society has created insurance and collateral and other financial and quasi-financial instruments for risk reduction, but many risks, and the most important risks, are far from covered. And as Pope Francis reminded us in his amazing encyclical last May on our shared responsibility for addressing climate change, it is clear that the damages from risks realized fall disproportionately on those least able to, a shock, to absorb the shocks. Facing risk requires both personal and collective courage. And to bring this back to design, we as designers see design as a risk reduction strategy. We research, we test, we run pilots, we measure, we perform, we adjust, we promote public good. Or at least, I hope most of us, we try. Well-tuned design facing complex challenges can and will bring the payback due for assuming risk. A higher quality of cities and urban life for today's global population and the billions more still to come. 
So here with us tonight to open the conversation on cities is OMA's Rainier de Graff. We've had the good fortune to host Rainier on several occasions for our public lectures, each time hearing him raise questions more pressing or pointed than the last time. It was just a little over a year ago that Rainier last visited Penn Design with a provocative talk on the role of architecture. We hope to hear more. Rainier joined OMA in 1996, and he's responsible for building and master planning projects in Europe, Russia, and the Middle East, including the new G-Star headquarters in Amsterdam, the Stadskontur City Hall under construction in Rotterdam, and the Noratorn Residential Tower in Stockholm, and the Commonwealth Institute now under construction in London. But what's especially relevant tonight is his double identity. In 2002, he became director of AMO, the think tank of OMA, and produced the Image of Europe, an exhibition illustrating the history of the European Union. He's overseen AMO's increasing involvement in sustainability and energy planning, including ZCRAT, a strategic master plan for the North Sea, the publication in 200, 2010 of Roadmap 2050, a practical guide to a prosperous low carbon Europe, with the European Climate Foundation and the Energy Report, a global plan for 100% renewable energy by 2050 with the World Wildlife Foundation. De Graaf has worked recently extensively in Moscow, overseeing OMA's, few risks there, overseeing OMA's proposal to design the master plan for the Skolkovo Center for Innovation, the Russian Silicon Valley, and leading a consortium that has proposed a development concept for the Mo Moscow agglomeration, an urban plan for Greater Moscow. He's very busy. He recently, recently curated two exhibitions on hold at the British School in Rome in 2011, and the traveling exhibition, Public Works, Architecture by Civil Service, which was in the Venice Biennale in 2012 and seen in Berlin in 2013. Rainier joins his OMA colleague, Laura Baird, in teaching studio here at Penn Design. Please welcome Rainier to the podium. And thank you all for being here. I'm, I'm really honored that I get to speak here at the 125th uh, anniversary of the Department of Architecture. I also find it intimidating because I me mean, talking about the future is always difficult at moments when you are honoring the past, and I guess the only appropriate tribute would be to look 125 years ahead, which uh, is certainly no small matter. I want to talk um, about the city, and that actually is not easy, because the city was a subject that was ours, and when I say ours, I mean our profession. Uh, but I often have the feeling that it is no longer uh, ours. I'll, I'll show more of that in a minute. I think it's incredibly important that we make it ours uh, again. And in this lecture, I would like to reflect on the reasons why uh, and possibly also outline uh, what might be needed to do that. I have uh, composed this lecture uh, of five small parts. Uh, each of them have a name, and the first one is called SMART. Uh, we are called the Office for Metropolitan uh, Architecture. That name, of course, indicates that there was a, fas uh, a fascination with the city, maybe even more with the city uh, than with architecture uh, from the get-go. And the office started with a book, not my book, but somebody else's book, uh, when I was about 14. Uh, so. But anyway, the book describes New York. It actually describes Manhattan as the laboratory, the urban laboratory uh, of the machine age. It describes uh, the invention of the skyscraper as an encounter between steel and the elevator that essentially allows the multiplication of every single site into an infinite number of sites. And it describes the effects that has uh, on the city. And this is one of the projects, and earlier projects from 1972, which is captured uh, in the end of the book. And the effect of the skyscraper is that since it multiplies any given site, it has the potential uh, to basically make each building a reproduction of the world, of the whole world. And when each building 
is a reproduction of the world. The world no longer needs to provide any coherence uh, between buildings. It is also the moment that architectural utopias in a way become interchangeable and mutually neutralized. They become subservient to a larger, more abstract order. Uh, in this case, uh, the Manhattan grid. And in doing that, they, in a way, from totalizing views, uh, also become, uh, in a way, like the products in a supermarket. And in that sense, this drawing is incredibly uh, important because it, in a way, prefigures two things. It prefigures the postmodern condition, and it also prefigures the effect of the market uh, economy uh, on our profession. Well, anyway, that was 40 years ago. Meanwhile, we built the buildings, you know, reproductions of the world uh, ourselves, in this case, in Rotterdam. The building is called the Rotterdam, so if not a reproduction of the world, it's a rep attempting to be a reproduction of that city. It's also known as the vertical uh, city. And of course, next to doing building, we continue to think uh, about the city emphatically. This is a random uh, stripping of our library uh, made, made for this lecture, but I think the point is uh, clear. We think uh, about the city, and let's say 40 years ago, thinking about the city wasn't so evident. The, the book about New York was uh, up to a certain uh, extent uh, controversial. But meanwhile, the city is on everyone's agenda. Everybody talks uh, about the city, and also, quite frankly, a lot of people that, in my opinion, shouldn't be talking about the city. This is an announcement uh, of a smart city conference, which is generally populated by about 99% by non-architects. Uh, and they've done uh, executives from uh, the digital industry, from the tech industry, mainly they've done a very clever thing because by calling their city smart, they in a way condemn uh, all our efforts so far to being uh, stupid. So <clears throat> uh, I too regularly uh, speak at these conferences and uh, I, I generally have an enormous problem speaking at these conferences because frankly, I don't know what the smart city is. And I have a latent suspicion that nobody knows what the smart city is. I mean, at all these conferences, I've never met anybody, whether from IBM, Siemens, or God knows what, who's been able to tell me unequivocally what it is. So when you don't know what something is, what do you do? What, today's definition of being smart is that you go on Google. So in the run-up to this conference, that's what I did. I went on Google, and I, I think the title was something like uh, Engineering Smart Cities of the Future, or something as generic like that. So I did a little, little kind of linguistic deconstruction of the symposium title. I typed in city, and I got images of cityscapes, skyline, all relatively familiar stuff, stuff that I feel at home with. Uh, there may even be some of our buildings uh, in here, uh, et cetera, et cetera, but this is home ground. Then I proceeded and I typed in smart. Now, smart is a car. <laughs> smart is a smart car. Smart is a smart, evident. And then I typed in the future. What is the future? The future is a road sign. Nobody quite knows where, but it's, it's, it's very strange that somehow the Google algorithm gives you an orgy of road signs uh, when you talk about the future. I don't know what that means, but, it, but they do. So then I continued my deep dive uh, in Google. And I, I mean, the smart city, does it have something to do with cars? It must have something to do with computers. So I typed in those two words, and the combination of those two words landed me in the middle of the Volkswagen scandal. <laughs> Volkswagen diesel information, and that is probably the best definition of being smart, that the combination of cars and computers ultimately is a very clever way of beating, or rather cheating, the system. So there I was. So then I Googled, and, and I, I wasn't any wiser. In fact, I was a lot more confused than when I hadn't Googled. Uh, considered canceling, considered calling in sick, uh, but then no, because I mean the latter suspicion that actually I was probably not the only one in the room not knowing what he was talking about. 
uh, made me reconsider. And maybe that's the whole point. Maybe the smart city isn't a subject. It is deliberately vague, so it's an alibi for everybody to talk about what they want to talk about anyway. And you don't have to conduct any checks whether it's relevance. These are network occasions where you can just talk. So I then, in a way, decided to talk about the one term uh, that I did know about, and I did a little, uh, uh, a little analysis of, of that cities. We design cities. We even design ideal cities from scratch, using the desert as a tabula rasa here in the case of Ras al Khaimah, a sustainable city for about 200,000 uh, inhabitants designed from scratch, and in doing that, we, in a way, uh, continue a long tradition. This is Palma Nova in Italy from the 16th century, designed by an architect in totality as a holistic uh, vision. It's a product from the Renaissance. It's, of course, the Renaissance, which went back to the Romans, as in the case here of the Vitruvian Man by Leonardo da Vinci. Vitruvius, you know, designing diagrams in the first century before Christ's which actually uh, were the root of the formation uh, of cities, also an architect. Later applied in Islamic culture in the 8th century here, a plan for Baghdad, uh, applied in the Renaissance for Sinda uh, by Filareta, applied in the 18th century in Germany in a plan for Karlsruhe, applied in the late 19th, early 20th century by Ebenezer Howard, uh, uh, as a diagram and physically also applied even literally uh, in the middle of the 20th century. So that's a long and very consistent uh, tradition. The manipulation of the images helps, uh, of course, but the point is, is clear. So then we move to the 21st century. And the 21st century, something changes where the city was a physical, material entity with ingredients that you needed. Here, all of a sudden, in the case of the smart city, it becomes a definition of needs without a clear clue of how these needs will be met. Uh, a, a great deal uh, of abstractions, uh, generic terms, which you can, it's very hard to agree uh, or disagree with, uh, but apparently a circle uh, of authority in the middle of it all, and more than that, a unique ability in the middle of it all. There's only one problem with that, is that that ability apparently is no longer ours. You know, what used to be ours in the case of Vitruvius in this day and age is apparently Oracle. That is troubling in a way, because it means that next to architecture, we have another architecture. We have an architecture between quotation marks. It's an architecture that sort of uses the same language. I mean, each of these terms, we know them, we know what they are, we know their physical manifestations, but each of these terms today are more often used in a metaphorical way than in a literal uh, way. They are the language uh, of the tech industry. They are the language of the digital uh, world, and it is now the digital world that draws the city of the future. It is the thousand and one companies that all are dealing uh, with the city, which are all from the tech industry. They write manifestos. Well, they write advertising slogans, but I guess in this day and age, that's roughly the same. Uh, and, and, and they write very, very confidently. They almost write as confidently as architects did at the beginning of the 20th uh, century. And there is a sense of bewilderment and a strange sense of deja vu, almost about the naive optimism that the city would be a controllable fact that the city is a problem which can be solved and you live happily ever after. We kind of learned the hard way, and I guess they only will over time. But I, I looked at the language. So these are the three, let's say, major players, uh, Siemens, Cisco, and, and IBM. And I, I, I looked closely at what they said. Smart city development is a question of when, not if, a question of how, not what, why. Because we live in a world experience, economic turmoil, climate change, aging populations, and rapid urbanization. And, and uh, then they talk about, it is another, IBM. Climate change, rising uh, energy uh, prices. Uh, and then it somehow ends on the utility bill. I don't quite know what one has to do with the other. Uh, uh, this is Siemens, urbanization, population growth, climate change, dwindling uh, resources. And if you add up the three statements, I mean, together these guys have got the answer to everything, to every single conceivable 
major global problem that is pestering us right now. Climate change, dwindling resources, aging populations, rising energy, economic growth, population growth, and rapid urbanization, all of it can be solved. And this is a relatively new phenomenon, but I thought to myself, in a way, I've heard this type of language before, and I, I know the formula. I mean, the formula is so familiar and, and so very old, and then I found out where. It's actually a formula applied in the Bible. You know, you predict the apocalypse only to offer redemption. Uh, it, it's, it's a very good narrative. For the, and I will show wonders in the heavens and the earth. The sun shall be turned into darkness, the moon into blood before the great coming. Of and those who ever call the name of the Lord shall be saved. So in this case, I guess you could replace the Lord by IBM. Um, they offer competences. Uh, or they claim to offer competences, smart water, smart public services, smart mobility, smart buildings. This is Cisco. Uh, IBM goes a step further, healthcare, public safety, social service, education, energy. Uh, here again, transport, security, energy, water, healthcare. And, and it's a very interesting thing because if, even if you add up those competences together, you more or less have the tasks that at one point was performed by the public sector. But in this day and age, the public sector is no longer, and I guess cumulatively, they claim to be some kind of ersatz uh, public sector, which I, well, it would be very good if they could, uh, but nevertheless, we don't vote for IBM, we don't vote for Cisco, uh, we don't do any of that. So there is a clear uh, certain political issues with these things. This is an example. It's, it's, I, I always like the example. This is the uh, Centro de Operaçaos in the Prefeitura of Rio. It's, a, it's, it's also known as Rio's digital town hall. Uh, it was built by IBM uh, with a clear uh, analogy of NASA's control room in, in Houston. Employees are, are, are forced to wear these kind of astronaut suits. Uh, but, of course, there is something strange about that analogy, because if you take the analogy literal, it means that the city, which is all around you, which is very near, in a way is treated like it's outer space. It's treated as something you observe, but you don't control. You have no hope uh, of controlling it. So here they are. They sit, they look at computer screens, and they see Rio. Now, they see that Rio has favelas. They see that Rio is poor. But what changes when you look at that on a computer screen? What essentially changes when you make that subject to big data and you know in eight digits behind the comma exactly how poor it is, how many floodings there are, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, if there isn't any political in program in place to actually do something uh, about it? It's something I, I really wonder, but I mean, in a way, IBM is very clear uh, on this. I think I showed this video last year, so I, I won't show it uh, again. But in a way, uh, this is a video from an American city where actually uh, they claim uh, through big data, through monitoring, through algorithms uh, to create patterns, which actually allows the police in advance to know where certain crimes will be committed, stopping it before uh, it even happens. And I. It's, it's in a way quite ironic that this, this video was filmed in the St. Louis area. And St. Louis, meanwhile, is known for quite a different form uh, of policing, uh, where they certainly, well, I don't know whether they stopped it before it happened when they killed uh, Michael Brown, uh, but it's a police presence which is considerably less discreet than any of the video uh, suggests. And the only real smart technology is actually in the almost military style uniforms that police officers, meanwhile, dressed like soldiers uh, wear. Uh, the St. Louis metropolitan area is, is interesting. I mean, any claims to creating public safety are immediately defied. When you look at what the status of that area is in terms of uh, public safety and its record, surprise, surprise, it's not very good. It's not very good. It's, it's a real challenge. And that is the challenge that IBM has risen to. That is the challenge that they in a way, with technology, want to meet. I thought it was very interesting that the first thing they did as part of their smart city involvement was give themselves an award. Um, but anyway, of course, St. Louis is interesting because we know 
St. Louis as architects. St. Louis is the burying ground of modernism, or at least that's what Charles Jenks claim, many have claimed it with him, and it's become a bit of a truism uh, in architecture. Uh, the pruitt Igo estate, the final coup de grace by uh, dynamite. So that was uh, 1969, shortly before the demolition. That's that place currently. It's a forest in the middle of a deserted city. Uh, it's a place that you really have to point at uh, with an arrow uh, in order to know where that thing was. And this was there. And then at a certain moment, that was there no longer. And the de demolition of this quarter is, of course, seen by many since Jenks, not only as a death of modern architecture, but the complete death of any pretense uh, architecture can have to credibly deal uh, with the city. So in a way, uh, St. Louis meant the burying ground of this. St. Louis is currently the home of this, the laboratory of this. And of course, we time will tell if this thing uh, will, will have a better faith uh, than our attempts, but, but we will see, and we have to remain to see. Um, the second part of my talk is called uh, Real. Sorry. And uh, Real deals uh, with the city uh, as it stands. I, in a way, always wonder why we talk about the city of the future when the city of today is such an incredibly unconceptualized things that we have so much trouble coming to terms with. These are the largest cities in the world at the moment. With the exception of Tokyo, none of these cities are rich uh, and none of these cities are Western. Some shift has taken place where the metropolis, which at one point was a Western phenomenon, has now become a non-Western uh, phenomenon. It takes uh, place predominantly in, in Asia. It also takes place in, in a kind of absence of theory from architects. If this is the curve of urbanization in Asia, the most rapid one uh, in the history of man, and these are the manifestos on the city over time, it is very interesting that in a way they started growing precisely at a moment that we stopped thinking. That the growth of Asia uh, happens in the context where manifestos by architects are rejected, that the growth of Asia happens in the age of Fukuyama, the end of history and the last man, which is incidentally also the end of ideological manifestos uh, like this. To presume triumph of Western liberal democracy as a homogenous condition uh, for the whole world. If this was the world before 1991, uh, a global territory contested by a number of competing uh, ideologies. This was the world presumed uh, to be after 1991, essentially uh, a global spread of Western liberal democracy. I guess all of this in a way started earlier, uh, really started with the opening up of China, China's open door policy. Uh, at the time, uh, secretly uh, assumed that it would also lead to a more democratic China. Uh, Deng Xiaoping in 1978 got the man of the year uh, from time. Uh, but clearly that open door policy led to an explosion of Chinese GDP, led to an explosion uh, of urbanism. Uh, and in a way that whole explosion, of course, has become a very prominent tool uh, in, in Chinese propaganda. To the point that you wonder, uh, is urbanization a symptom of a growing economy or is urbanization almost the root core uh, of a growing economy, because if you look at images like this, that's almost the feeling uh, you get. Well, of course, this was the way the world was presumed uh, to be. This was what actually happened, uh, not a completely democratic world, uh, a world contested by some countries that, are, that have elections, some countries that have remained non-democratic and an increasing category, which is sort of democratic, but not really. And the irony was that where this was presumed to be a Western triumph, uh, that when the world would become democratic, it would become rich. In a way, the two were linked. Uh, the, the, the promise of democracy came 
uh, with the promise of economic uh, prosperity. And the irony is that if you look at the performance, these are the sovereign wealth funds uh, of states, uh, and you look at the economic performance, that increasingly, in a way, electoral democracy in terms of performance is outperformed by countries that aren't. It is a strange irony that countries, even a, former, a formerly communist country like China, like Vietnam, places like Singapore and Dubai are outperforming the West uh, economically. And I, I also wonder what that means for a lot of the ideological uh, claims. Let's have a look. This is Dubai in 1990, Sheikh Zayed Road. That's the main artery uh, of the city, uh, the road uh, from the center leading to Abu Dhabi. This is that same road uh, 13 years later, and this is that same road today. It's very interesting that this nothing in this picture is older than 20 years. Nevertheless, we have here a thriving metropolis that can compete, at least in terms of image, with any global uh, metropolis uh, in the world, created almost overnight. What started, in a way, as a Bedouin uh, village uh, founded by Iranian smugglers, struck oil, modernized uh, in the 60s and the 70s, had a flirt with good architecture uh, for a while, uh, Japanese avant-garde architects notoriously active in, in the Arab world, and even had a flirt with planning. This is interesting. This is uh, a master plan for the whole city, which there is actually the whole state, by Parsons in 1993. It was supposed to be valid for, for about 20 years. Then, of course, the city got very successful. The city exploded. Uh, and that master plan very quickly uh, fell apart or wasn't able to keep track of what actually happened. I mean, people started to draw a new master plan, your typical image of engineers with short, short sleeves, uh, fine liners, felt taps, and, and, and rash uh, conjugations of a city, uh, which is partially a drawing of a city and partially some sort of economic formula that makes everyone, uh, or at least them, uh, rich. Um, and uh, as I said, that, that whole master plan broke down. In 2003, uh, less than 10 years later, a new master plan had to be uh, conceived uh, in order to frame what was going on. Uh, but currently, uh, we're, we're 2015. For a long time, that whole master plan has already been overtaken yet again by events, at which point the only credible master plan you can make for a city like that is an aerial photograph, uh, which means it's a registering of what happens rather than a controlling of what happens. And any photograph uh, they, of course, make is manipulated with, uh, with events that haven't happened yet, but they are collaged in such a way that whenever you look at a map of Dubai, you look at a map of the future. Uh, Interestingly, this isn't there, probably will never happen, that isn't there yet, that is kind of halfway gone, uh, et cetera, et cetera, uh, et cetera. But on the whole, <clears throat> this is a very interesting or alarming breakdown of the concept of city as a whole, because in a way what the city is, is a collection of cities. It is no longer a singular phenomenon. It, the whole city is a collection of small master plans, urban developments, themed urban developments, in a way a collection of theme parks, which in a way compete for attention in, the attracting, uh, in attracting future populations. And if you go back to the image from the city of the captive globe, we have a very interesting situation here. Because what this image means for architecture, that is the end of architecture as a totalizing vision, the justice of position uh, of visions next to each other in a kind of value-free system. That is, in a way, what New York uh, is to architectural ideology. Dubai is, in a way, to the city. It's an explosion of competing views of how the city would be, which simply exist, coexist in the same framework. And that framework, of course, isn't a grid, because the Manhattan grid, even in the context of Dubai, is one of many. Uh, but that, in a way, is, is, is something that still consists in a framework, and that framework is largely political. Let's just sort of get it. There is no accurate study of Dubai's current development, not because we're incapable of conducting such a study, but because the time such a study is materialized on paper, it would no longer be valid, as the achievement pace would have exceeded it by folds. 
At which point planning, I guess, is a form of air traffic control. It's a form of monitoring what happens here in Dubai. Instead of looking at the skies, you look at the land. Uh, and, and, or maybe it is, it's a situation of kind of war simulations, as you have in war rooms, where in a way troop movements and ship movements are, are, are simulated in order to prepare for battle. Here it's like Hadid, uh, the Palm, and, and, and whatever. Uh, simply a series of large developments which only have to ensure that they don't bite uh, each other. Uh, strangely reminiscent of the image in uh, Rio, because I mean the same control room there uh, has a very deliberate uh, meaning in, in this context and directly relates to the way the city is governed. This is the way the city is governed, a kind of endless uh, bureaucracy and an endless uh, array of public uh, departments. I mean, this diagram wouldn't look probably any different uh, to the diagrams uh, used to manage a city in the Netherlands or even uh, here. Uh, and of course, there are heads of these departments, but there's a very interesting difference. This is the public sector. This is the private sector. And it's not because of local dress. Uh, or anything uh, that you see this, but actually the same people populate either side of the line. I mean, if you take political office in the West, and probably even Trump will have to do this, you relinquish business interests for the time you are in office. We have a separation between the public and the private because the public is meant to control the private. This is based on a kind of family uh, logic, and here, business interests are almost a prerequisite for being able to execute public office. Uh, this is an example. Uh, three people, uh, one, uh, chairman of Dubai Holdings is the head of the executive council. The uh, chief of Imar, the largest property developer in the world, is the, the head of the economic development department. And the chairman of Nakhil, another real estate development, controls the, the, the Jebel Ali port, a very big public uh, port. There is uh, another element. I mean, wh whoever has visited Dubai has encountered the endless uh, billboards of private, small, supposedly small private companies who are involved in the development of the city. This is the front we see. When you research each and every one of them and you start digging to mother companies, holdings, holding companies of holdings, uh, share ownerships of the holding, it's like rivers that slowly start to converge and end up in a single river. 51% uh, of this is owned by uh, Nakheel, 51% of Nakheel is owned by Dubai World, and 51% of Dubai World is owned by the ruler of the country, who ultimately owns 51% of all these holdings. And thereby, what we see as free entrepreneurship, the free market, is nothing but a simulated free market, which happens in a state of total control, uh, and in a way uh, permits a weird and rapid uh, development of this small city-state as a whole, because rather the whole thing is not run like a country, it's essentially run uh, like a business. And in the current world, uh, this is a very strange, uh, strangely successful formula, where Western liberal democracy has a kind of bastardized version which outperforms uh, it. Something similar goes for uh, Singapore, uh, of course. It's interesting, Singapore is a city-state, uh, but it's also, uh, as much as it is a state, as much as it is a country, it's also a product, and it's even a form of knowledge, which is now branded, which is now exported, uh, and it even becomes a kind of uh, service provider to the development of Chinese uh, cities. There's a Singapore in Shenzhen, uh, Singapore in, in Hangzhou, and Singapore is also the model uh, for which the instant city, uh, something Stan Gale uh, promotes as, uh, for Songdo is largely modeled on. And these type of things are there. They're very much there, and they're there with an enormous uh, amount of confidence. This is what I found uh, the standard one. One day, all cities will be built like this, and then you mean this. There's another side. This is, number, this is part three. It is called uh, Urgent. Um, Clearly, uh, this is the world, presumed to be homogenous, but clearly uh, all is not equal, because, if only because there is still uh, an ever greater uh, divide between rich uh, and poor. This is the world 
compartmented according uh, to, to GDP. What is in a way the case that if you project uh, the fastest growing cities, that the vast majority is actually in a poor part of the world. The city is often presumed a ticket towards riches, a ticket to become prosperous, but the story is not that uh, simple. This is a diagram of certain cities that grow in terms of their economy and certain cities that simply grow in terms of their uh, population. Now, you can conduct uh, an analysis uh, on this, a very simple diagram. If the vertical axis is population growth, the horizontal axis is GDP growth, the dotted line is a presumed line of parity between uh, both. It means that when you're above the line, uh, of course, the inequalities that are already present are simply exacerbated, and if you're below the line, uh, the inequality diminishes this. So, to a large part, if you project these cities, globalization, like anything, has winners uh, and losers. There is no such thing as win-win, although that's a very popular uh, term. Um, urbanization is a neck-and-neck -neck race. Uh, it's a neck-and-neck -neck race not only between, it's currently 50%, that suggests it's a neck and neck race between urbanization and the rural. But urbanization is really a race, a neck and neck race, uh, towards slums. Uh, as soon uh, as the population grows faster than the economy, any uh, way to keep up by building infrastructure, provisions that you need to deal with ever larger numbers simply falls apart. So a strange way is that the more we aspire to this, the more we get this uh, in, in tandem, and, and it happens, and the numbers are staggering. And these things are not just happening in the forms of, of slums, as is the case here in South America. These are also phenomena that are pestering existing cities. Uh, this is a, a respectable socialist neighborhood in Beijing. Uh, this is a respectable socialist workers' neighborhood, middle-class neighborhood in the former uh, former Soviet uh, neighborhood in Russia. And increasingly, these, uh, behind the facades uh, of these developments, a different reality is taking place. Also, these cities grow. And these cities grow to the point that a two-room apartment is actually inhabited by 20 people who are often from former Soviet republics, who are not granted the right to be a Moscovite, so citizenship is denied uh, too many. Nevertheless, they are in the city. Nevertheless, they exist uh, and work in the city. For instance, in the case of Moscow, it is often estimated that the real size uh, of the city, the real population of the city, is about double uh, the 11 million that the city currently houses, simply uh, because these people don't register in any census. Formally, they don't exist. Formally, they're not there. Uh, they don't have a social security number. Uh, I mean, often through illegal traffickers, they're, they're being brought there, but they're part, partly responsible for a large part of the construction industry and, in the meantime, <coughs> a whole range of other things. They constitute a sizable economy, an economy that doesn't exist, that is illegal, but it's not necessarily criminal. I mean, a lot of the uh, activities that you see in here uh, in a way, are perfectly normal economic uh, activities that are just carried out by people who are not supposed to be there, who don't pay tax, and, and I guess that is their uh, only crime. If you look at this thing globally, and really globally, and you would add up uh, all these activities worldwide, you essentially get a shadow economy globally that is bigger than the economies of the US and China. There are predictions that as urbanization continues and continues at the same pace, that this number will only increase because the faster the city grows, grow, will grow, uh, the harder it is to keep up with their growth to the point that in 2020, 65% of the world's economy would actually, uh, of the world's population would actually be working uh, in the shadow uh, economy. And that is a interesting, but also I guess somewhat worrying thing because I mean, if powers are a question, if power is a question of numbers, there is a point that these people that don't exist are a majority over the people that do exist, with the, 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 the potential result that in the end, no one will exist. Um, a map of the world again, and outlined where the largest shadow economies are presumed to be. 
There's a new generation uh, of cities, uh, cities that grow even faster than some of the mega cities I showed earlier. And with pinpoint accuracy, these cities are in the part of the world where the largest possible shadow economy is. That coincides. It's a new generation of cities next to the established mega cities uh, like Mumbai, et cetera, et cetera, that everybody talks about. There's a new generation of cities. This is currently the top 10 of fast growing uh, cities Abuja, Sana, uh, Kabul, uh, et cetera. And the interesting thing is that these cities are all somehow in war torn, destabilized uh, areas. Uh, Abuja is number one. Uh, Sana in Yemen is number two. Uh, I, I suppose everybody watches the news. Uh, Kabul uh, is number four. Uh, Mogadishu is number seven on that list, and Baghdad is number 10 uh, on the list. So if you make another superimposition, another comparison, and you look at the world, and you make a map of, let's say, what I guess what you could call the stability of the nation state, this is done by our office, so we took a few liberties uh, in producing this, this map. But in, in broad strokes, it's, it's good. This is, in blue is where you can assume a relatively solid presence of the state, and the more you progress towards red, the more that stability is more or less non-existent. It's very interesting that in, in a weird way, the product of all this instability are actually products of wars waged by the West. Uh, Afghanistan, I mean, I guess known uh, in America, uh, Ukraine, etc. Uh, there's the war on terror here, there's the war on African dictators here, and there's largely the war on drugs uh, that has helped destabilize large parts of uh, Central and South America. Again, with pinpoint accuracy, the fastest growing cities are in the least stable areas uh, of the world, where the city, in a way, becomes a refuge. It becomes a refuge with a checkpoint. You never know who are the good and the bad guys, at least I don't, uh, in these images. But I mean, the gates of Sana, uh, the gates in, of, of Bamako in Mali, and again, the gates of Baghdad uh, in Iraq. And looking at these images, a very strange and pressing analogy presented itself to me. It was this. Uh, it's warfare uh, somewhere in, in the Middle Ages, uh, when cities were regularly uh, under siege, uh, and cities were actually walled entities uh, with a relative degree of safety and freedom inside. Cities were safe havens in the context of permanently contested territories uh, around them. And of course, the increased political relevance uh, of cities is not just on our radar, it's on the radar of many. Uh, this is Benjamin Barber, who wrote a book, If Mayors uh, rule uh, the world. It's a rather, uh, it's an embellishment of mayors uh, who are primarily his audience. It's not very critical, uh, but at least he's onto something because I mean cities by now uh, are, are larger, have larger economies uh, than countries. So the fact that their uh, political weight will have to be increased one way or another is, is very, very uh, evident. Uh, of course, this is the current uh, projections of urbanization. When you continue them, uh, you could move to 100% urbanization before the turn of the next century, and we will have a completely urbanized world. The, lo the fourth part is called false. Uh, it is called false because, yes, this is true, but I am very doubtful uh, if the current fascination for cities is where it ends, if it's the real story. Because larger than cities, uh, as a product of globalization, are currently corporations. You can simply continue uh, the list. Walmart and Shell are bigger than Sao Paulo and bigger than Mexico City, and even way bigger than Finland, etc., etc. Barbara's ties with Bloomberg uh, are well known, and it is my suspicion that many uh, of those who simply advocate the power of cities are simply advocating the power of global capital, are simply advocating in a veiled manner uh, the power of, of corporations. Of the 100 large economies in the world, 37 are corporations. These are three 
lists, three rankings of the size of economies. Uh, the left countries, cities, corporations. You would assume a hierarchy in scale going from left to right. But actually, when you make a list which ignores all categories, it gets completely muddled up. Uh, you get Walmart, which is bigger than uh, Norway, bigger than Kobe. You get uh, BP, which is bigger than Greece. This is probably outdated. It's even after the <laughs> billion euro support package. But uh, you get uh, Cisco is bigger than Lebanon. Uh, Ford is bigger than uh, Morocco. And, and the free floating global capital, you can wonder if globalization is anything other uh, than an archipelago, a global archipelago of corporate uh, interests. <coughs> <coughs> that clearly uh, has an effect. That has an effect on the nation state and it has effect on the public sector because you could more or less say, this is again uh, not very scientific, I apologize, uh, but you can roughly say that corporate growth is the inverse uh, of corporate uh, loyalty, that where previously corporations had some loyalty to the nations uh, in which they were founded or in which their headquarter was, that that loyalty uh, at this moment completely lies with a, a community, a global community of other corporations, that then in a way the nation uh, is the old one uh, out. Uh, let's look at it. Uh, I mean, Amazon faces European Union tax uh, avoidance, uh, Starbucks uh, has a kind of similar uh, case. And uh, I think this one is priceless. Google chairman Eric Schmidt defends tax judge. It's called capitalism. I think it sums it up uh, very, very nicely. The uh, asymmetry uh, in that sense is in a way closely matched by another asymmetry. The world's 40 largest mega regions only cover 3% uh, of the Earth's uh, surface. So you can, in a way, see that the asymmetry in the division of economic means is, in a way, mirrored in an asymmetry of occupying the territories. This is uh, how we settle uh, on the planet or what part we use on it. Cities get bigger and bigger, but at the same time, uh, if this is the outline of the agglomeration, you look at the actual size of the cities that give their names to these agglomerations, you see that it's in general, it's a very, very small part, which also means that if you want mayors to rule the world, you should probably first make sure that they rule their own city. Uh, because in a way, the, uh, there is a theoretical responsibility of a mayor over the problems in an entire agglomeration when the vast majority of those problems completely exceed uh, his, his mandate, which make mayors the kind of more or less passive uh, recipient of a whole load of blame uh, often. Um, there is an initiative in uh, China at the moment to counter that. This is a fairly recent thing, a new mega city from Beijing, Tianjin, and Hebei, uh, population of 130 million, in an effort uh, to bring uh, the degree of public control back to the appropriate scale, to the scale at which the city uh, de facto exists uh, at the current moment. The last chapter is a plea uh, and, and, and a potential uh, shift in thinking uh, that I would like to outline that could be the beginning of, in a way, addressing a number of the problems uh, I, I've outlined. Um, in 2001, uh, Al Gore presented his Inconvenient Truth uh, the Earth's surface would be vastly diminished as a result of climate change and consequently rising sea levels. But in a way, we have preemptively already started that trend uh, ourselves. This is the Earth's surface in full. This is what remains of it when you uh, only keep areas with more than 25 people per square kilometers, with more than 50, with more than 125 and this is the supposed mega regions. We, in a way, inhabit the world uh, simply as a given currently, as though it is an archipelago of very, very large urbanized regions. It's almost like a collection of city-states, almost like a collection of city-states that, in a way, formed uh, antiquity. 
it is very interesting. The Greeks' uh, name for city is polis, which actually means the space of many. It's the space where many have to agree on a common cause, and from it comes the word uh, politics. Um, it's an interesting thing, because, I mean, our word urbanism comes from the Roman urbs, uh, and the Roman uh, urbs defined the city as a material condition. The Greek polis defines it essentially as a political condition. And in defining the city exclusively as a material uh, condition, we have in a way opened the door very, very widely to a claiming of the city by capital and to a claiming of the city as a purely economic uh, entity, as an alibi for the economy and private interests to go uh, unchecked. Uh, maybe the word megalopolis, which I prefer to megacity, could be the beginning of again defining the city, not purely as an urbanistic or material entity, but in addition also as a political uh, entity. And this could in a way be uh, the description, not only of a phenomena, but maybe of a completely unique field of knowledge that you need to deal with the city, a knowledge that is a hybrid between all our traditional planning uh, and material skills, but also uh, with politics as a form of design, and politics no longer as a subcategory of the economy, but politics as something in its own right which could re-engage with the economy in an appropriately dialectical uh, relation. Uh, it's a subject that's up for grabs. Uh, it could be taught uh, in the curriculum uh, of universities. Uh, 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 maybe uh, <laughs> at the start of something. And it's the title of actually your forthcoming book where I will explain a number of things in, in a bit more uh, detail. Thank you. Are there any questions? Sorry? I thought it was a very different talk. Uh, well, I mean, it was, it ended on informality instead of ending on politics. Um, but the no, broad. It, end, it ended on politics too. If that one ended on politics it, Yeah, too, it right? ended on the whole world being a, one big pseudo democracy. So, so, in a way, it set up the condition for this talk. I'm curious then, um, you know, having. Uh, kind of like Wile E. Coyote inherited this bowling ball candle that you're now trying to figure out what to do with. Um, how are you acting on this information, knowledge, perspective, something? What we, uh, well, in as much as it's within our power as architects to uh, act on this information, because, I mean, a lot of the things uh, I actually tell draw from experiences we encounter when we simply try to do our job, you know, and often we are at least partially complicit into phenomena that also we don't think are entirely uh, endorsable. What we do mostly, and, and we actually do that in almost any job, is that we try to create a triangulation. You always have a client. Your client is generally private, but there is still the city authorities that have to give approval to the plans of your private client. So rather than working for the client and just trying to convince cities, we created triangulations where we often use whatever powers, legal powers, cities still have also to enforce certain views uh, on, on our clients. It's in a way a sort of menage à trois. Uh, where at least it becomes possible to create projects with a certain larger political ideological dimensions more than when you would just execute the wishes of your clients. And I could imagine that a magnification of that simple principle, uh, which, by the way, involves a lot of uh, manipulation uh, and productive dishonesty uh, on our part, but I do think that is, that is what politics is. 
uh, in the end. It, it's not a very heroic métier, but I could imagine that that type of triangulation magnified to a larger scale could be a formula uh, to, uh, to do something about this. Isn't that kind of an argument that a lot of, quite frankly, less sophisticated firms would also make that, yeah, they also are kind of trying to keep the public's interest in mind while they work for um, highly resourced, highly leveraged, highly connected um, clients that have, as you so kind of cogently put it, obliterated time and space and just about everything else. I'm not sure, and I think you have to go by the results uh, in that sense. Which well, I, I'm asking you, what are the results? Sorry? I know I'm curious what, in your experience, are the results of that? Uh, well, in our case, the results are projects that we, to some extent, can be quite proud of that actually surpass being merely a translation of wishes of the clients. I'm sure a lot of less sophisticated uh, firms would say the same. Uh, maybe everybody would say the same. But I mean, I, I, I then hopefully uh, means that in your definition of less sophisticated, that in my definition, that would be mirrored by less having less ground to say the same thing. Um, can I propose something? And then maybe we can talk about it after, because I don't want to hog the mic. But um, I think part of what's interesting about Cisco and these other firms is that they've uh, co-opted management as opposed to like we have a solution for you they're selling a process that as you said it's like pretty hard to nail down no they sell sensors yeah. that, is, that is nonsense they but, sell sensors I mean for them yeah. the whole rhetoric about the city is nothing but a bid book everything is a tender uh, and nobody I mean, and we have dealt with Cisco and, and all these guys quite extensively once you dig deep enough once you start to sort of peel off the layers of supposed sophistication, that's what they do. They sell sensors. No, you know, no, and I, there is such no. an ulterior motive in selling sensors that I think any general claim of being able to deal with something as public and general as the city is null and void by definition. No, I, I agree and I share your skepticism, but what's neat about the Rio example is that um, they are selling, you know, there's a long ontology of that, uh, of that urban control room that you showed going back to the NASA project in the 1940s when, you know, Britain was trying to track fighters that were going over its shores and stuff like that, and it's the image of total control, and they're selling that image. But they're yeah. selling it as a management process, and I'm wondering if perhaps a way out of the conundrum that you've articulated is selling yeah, but ourselves as managers and not product makers. And that's where I'll leave it. I don't want to hold the mic. Uh, but I think that depends completely on the circumstances within which you apply uh, such a thing. I mean, once you apply something like the control center of Rio, you know, in tandem with a philosophy, uh, which Eduardo Paez has, uh, a philosophy of a retracting public sector, it, 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 it simply becomes an observatory and a gimmick. Because, I mean, the whole effect of the monitoring is bragging uh, about the monitoring in videos on YouTube, etc., etc., etc. When it's not combined with a political agenda to, to act on the things you monitor, it, it remains null and void. And that's, that is, to some extent, my plea. This is not a plea against uh, technology or not a kind of uh, overall cynicism. And I'm sorry if it comes across that way. But it's, it's simply technology in itself is meaningless. It can be an agent for the bad as it can be an agent for the good. Uh, and to some extent, technology without a political dimension uh, remains a fairly one-dimensional thing. Uh, hello. Sorry. Yeah, uh, I was one, based on your here. Hi. Hi. Uh, draw, drawing on this question specifically and your ending remarks on the role of politics, I was wondering uh, if you have any thoughts on your role or the role of architects in divided in, in areas in the you know perhaps in the Middle East or of the world where there's a lack of uh, central government, there's a lack of planning, there's complete deregulation and corruption. Uh, so in what ways um, are you know, designers and architects that are in touch with extremely powerful um, you know, clients that sometimes mimic the role of central government through processes of corruption? I'm thinking specifically about a project in Beirut uh, which I think OMA has been commissioned to work on um, 
and uh, the, there was a grassroots movement that came about in the last two years from you know citizens but also experts and academics and whatnot to kind of contest a construction on a specific site and this is just an uh, you know an example of where where if if in the lack of you know governance there's a way for designers to actually act on that role and say no you know in some places in some sites we don't build because of you know context or cultural heritage or cultural landscapes well i think we're not going to build on that site anytime soon but that's another uh, another matter but i mean the, the example is very very uh, good because i mean what we did uh, there uh, was an initial exploration that strangely enough makes the site more accessible uh, than it is now because currently there is an enormous fence and i've been to see it uh, so, so i, I it's know gone now. Uh, that's the no fence. but that, that is yeah. the case i mean it is not uh, the, the, the attributed public dimension that is out there in the media is is not there so our project in a way made 85 percent of that territory accessible to the public which is more than nothing we've also in a way when the whole controversy reached out we have reached out to the people who've raised it i mean we have sought uh, contact to simply act be able to act in a diligent way now we could have abstained completely uh, we could have completely surrendered uh, to uh, to the client and 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 you know clogged the whole thing with private development but this is generally in the nature of what architects do they it's it's and in that sense it's a very political uh, thing is that in a way it it is somehow less categorical than artists or journalists uh, can can afford to be and it is looking at a way to do things sensibly d doing uh, things in situations where often the good and the bad are in, involved in a neck and neck race but I think that it's very important that in architecture engaging with an issue is something else than endorsing uh, an issue and that space uh, exists and that is the space we we explore yeah I mean I, I, I agree with that totally but it's I mean I'm part of the campaign that addressed the letter and wrote yeah, Mr. Puhas, and you know yeah. we, we were <laughs> yeah. uh, yeah, I mean, I just I was thinking like in in a, in a specific context like Beirut, where you probably know from your visit and you know your readings and your research that there's a completely there's a complete absence of planning. There's you know extremely scarce public space, especially coastal space, and the specific site is, you know, it's ex is extremely rare in the Middle East on the Mediterranean coast and in the city itself. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I'm just wondering where sometimes there's a responsibility to just take a stand, specifically that you're addressing the role of, you know, Dubai. And I mean, this, the whole capital around this specific site is a replication of, you know, the trillion amount of different holdings and how the site was acquired as well uh, is just like a complete. Um, yeah, but the reality is that Sure, but I mean, the reality is that a lot of the world is like that. And, uh, you know, we can look away and, and, and have nothing uh, to do with it. But I doubt, uh, you know, in, in, in the grand scheme of things, whether that would benefit uh, anybody. I mean, how productive are principles of the underlying party? And uh, the West, uh, increasingly, our view is becoming uh, an underlying party in, in many uh, parts of the world. We are regularly outsmarted. Your government, the American government, is regularly outsmarted in almost any part uh, of the world. And I, I simply wonder whether, you know, because turning a blind eye to, to anything that doesn't conform to our standards, would very quickly lead to a kind of a, micro, a, a, a microscopic involvement on a very limited territory of the world. I think part of the message of what I said, and also what I said about Fukuyama, simply involves resigning to the fact that globalization is global. Globalization is not an expansion of Western principles to be universally shared. Globalization has no author it is global. That means that you run into situations with great regularity where you don't know what to do. Because, I mean, also, if we work in any of the red, 
I mean, any of my traditional urbanistic training can immediately go out of the window because there isn't the democratic procedures, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, that's, but I mean, I guess that's just our choice. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, from the perspective of uh, the organized knowledge that you presented us tonight, could you or would you imagine a product owned by a private corporation, the purpose of which is the management of humanware, the management of humanware, the law of which is the intelligent city. Uh, I'm not sure I understood. I okay. We, from the perspective of the knowledge that you presented us Tonight. this evening, yeah. would you or could you imagine a private corporation, the purpose of which is the management of humanware? Humanware. Humanware. We are humanware. And if we manage the story, of our lives according to the efficiency of economic man, this corporation may find a location that they would name the intelligent city in 2075. Could I imagine that? What, what is the question? If I can imagine that? The question is, how do, could we manage our needs with the efficiencies of corporate knowledge structures? We have personal lives, but if we look at those personal lives under efficient intelligent management. There may be some people who would opt for that possibility. But I, I think, uh, you know, an, an efficient, it's, it's all a question of motives. And I, I wonder if an efficient management of resources is ever fully possible when the system is essentially driven by competition, because it, it always invariably means the prioritization over certain needs, over certain resources, over that uh, of others. And whether, and when you mention the term corporate, uh, that means private, that means uh, competition, whether anything in the hands of a fully corporate situation can ever occur without the profound neglect uh, of some issues in, in the grander scheme of things, I, I seriously wonder. So my, my answer would be no. Well, maybe in competition, the purpose of the competition is winning. And winning involves a lot of knowledge. Mm -hmm. And for that reason, you may find customers. But I mean, I think the, the, the aim of a public sector is never winning. Because if you win, somebody else loses and, and that is a fundamentally different disposition than the task of a public sector which is supposed to take care of everybody oh, but and, winning... and there I, I simply think since winning you are very right is the prime aim of corporation I don't think it's ever possible to leave the greater good up to corporations winning can also mean high efficiency 
So there are multiple winners that are involved in the competition. And it is the management style, the management know-how that would establish winning on multiple levels of society. Yeah, maybe. I mean, maybe the, the, the knowledge you acquire, because, I mean, we are also a private practice. I mean, we're also not a government institution, and maybe the knowledge you acquire in the course of trying to be efficient could benefit the public sector, but I think it only will do so once, strangely enough, what you learn from winning can probably only really be put to use once the need to win is suspended. Uh, so in that sense, maybe, yes, the knowledge is generated uh, in, in those domains, but whether those domains can actually exercise them with a total responsibility for the whole is, is my question. That's a wonderful question, and we have a lot of time to answer it. Yeah. I mean, I do, or? It is learning from the past, having city planning involving significant preparation, thus intelligence, and come up with products who, of which we, as a humanity, can really be proud of. It's not for children. It's, it's for people of your presented experience that should address or could address the biggest artifact humanity is able to produce, and that is the city. And I thank you. Thank you. I don't know if my question is going to have the same depth as that one might have had. Um, but with the rising economic pressures <clears throat> on, on these global cities and these megalopolis, as you describe them, um, my question is essentially how much influence can architects truly have when thing, with, with statistics like 2014, the entire revenue of architecture in the United States was roughly $12.5 billion, which is one-tenth of what Walmart makes a quarter. So I was just wondering on your thoughts of how much influence we're really going to have on the development of these cities when the corporations well, yeah, have so much more resources. I, uh, probably not a lot in the end if you describe it in those terms. But of course, the addressing of problems always begins with the frank acknowledgement that there is a problem. Uh, and maybe from experience, uh, you talk about your experiences and maybe it's a small step in that direction that we can make as a, as a somehow a culturally uh, aware, uh, not overly materialistic uh, class of commonsensically thinking people. Uh, I mean, I think to some extent you draw from experiences even if your influence is limited, because that is the real paradox. Our influence is limited, but our exposure to a great many things is enormous. I mean, it's a very multifaceted <coughs> uh, job where you deal with a lot of players, where you deal with a lot of elements in the fourth force field. So your experiences are powerful, even if your mandate may be limited. And I mean, architecture is a very strange mixture. Uh, it's a kind of form of omniscience practiced in a context of an utter lack of power. You know, and... Um, one of the things that I think uh, maybe you're alluding to is uh, your current Dezim uh, editorial, I know was something that kind of came around the, the halls in here, and a lot of people, at least me in particular, was really pleased to hear what you had to say about the American academia. <laughs> and um, and it, it was at least thought-provoking enough because it resonates with a lot of conversations that's currently I wrote that up. in the full confidence that the zine wasn't read here. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> and I know. W would you mind, um, on a lighter note, uh, giving suggestions for students and academics based on maybe some of your comments? Based on that article? Oh, come on. Um, well, I, I think the article, it's, it's, I, I have a a serious and a less serious answer to it. I, I think I was often struck, uh, I mean, uh, particularly by the discussion between the characters I wrote about in the article, by somehow 
a combination of utter depth and very impressive detailed knowledge about certain things and, and at the same time a complete obliviousness of the significance of that type of knowledge. You know, it's, it's a kind of expression, life is what happens while you're planning other things. You know, the built environment is happening while the American academic scene is discussing other things. I mean, it's a similar analogy. So I do think that the whole academic world would benefit, at least temporary, from a reversal uh, of order of importance where context took priority uh, over the object uh, itself. And the other thing that struck me is that these people, even when they go to dinner, they do it in bright neon lights, uh, they avoid alcohol uh, because the dinner is just another round in a kind of completely futile boxing match uh, between views that quite frankly have no impact on, on the context. So lighten up uh, is, is something I would really encourage everyone uh, to, to do. Uh, I was looking at your uh, global map of the archipelago and, and the interesting part about the map is the part that isn't in the archipelago. It's, it's a gargantuanly larger area. And uh, the way I have, have thought about the globe is that the ar archipelago really needs um, that blank space to solve its problems. I believe the solution to the problems within the archipelago are outside of it. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if you, if you see um, your politics um, as solving what may be an adversarial position between the archipelago and the non-archipelago states. The hinterland. Yeah, yeah the hinterland. Mm. Yeah. Well, I mean, somebody else in our office is working on the hinterland uh, at the moment. So I, I'm, I'm, I'm sure that if the things are pursued in the right dialectic, we may be able to come up with something. But I, I think you're right. I mean, of course, I do not want to suggest that the hinterland or the fast countryside or, or a feather, a fast landmass outside the city has no uh, relevance because it is indeed, I mean, they have an enormous relevance, I mean, particularly in countries like here, if only through the disproportionate political the influence they have still in the absence of, of inhabitants. So, uh, yes, I think it's important, but the archipelago uh, drawing is, of course, largely also a rhetorical device uh, to create the analogy with uh, antiquity. But, I mean, it's, it's I, uh, I mean, not for a moment, think that the rest of the landmass doesn't exist and isn't important. Well, yeah, I mean, I mean, the ultimate consequence of the diagram is that there's nobody in the hinterland uh, anymore and that the hinterland is maybe consumed as a vast reservoir of resources, uh, energy, uh, uh, free of settlement, but clearly that it plays a role in how it's administered. And I'm also not advocating the disappearance of countries, uh, you know, like in a way Barber is hinting at in, in, in his book. I mean, it is simply a plea to define the cities that are emerging on the scale they are uh, emerging, to define them as political conditions in addition to the material condition. And yeah. Yeah, I'm not sure that is the case because I mean the the settle I mean the, the, the commonality between the unsettled space is that an increasing amount of people is trying to flee it uh, in favor of the city so I think we have a certain economic disbalance uh, between the two but w which will partially pan itself out over time because I mean uh, abandons of any space is always inevitably followed by its rediscovery later on so I think that you know, programs to delay the shrinking uh, of cities, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, we even have it in a small country like the Netherlands, uh, that a certain part of the, and to delay that, to counter that, they're often very, very futile. There's a bigger recipe in simply rediscovering and reinventing it in a new role. 
which I think will happen in tandem with the trend here. Are we done? Thank you.